only a place for people to come out and drink, but it was a place for people to come out, drink, have fun, get to know each other, and also be a part of the bike community. So um, this is one of those things that, that you know we're trying to do, to be able to get the people involved and, and people to get involved in the in the bike community. Um, Can everybody hear that music? Yeah. Does everybody know what that music is? Yeah. What is it? Star Wars. Star Wars, right? Anybody know what year that was? 77. You're right. <laughs> All right, so the reason why we played this music is because the motorcycles in the 70s, in the 60s and the 70s, the Japanese motorcycles, they were kind of boring. They were known as UJMs, Universal Japanese Motorcycles, which means that it was like all those bikes looked the same, okay? So, Motorrad Magazine in Germany wanted to find out from different design groups what the motorcycles of the 80s was going to look like. So they had three different design groups. Porsche design, uh, Ito design from Italy, and Target design. And Target design won the concept. So Target design, the main uh, owner of Target design was Hans Muth, who was involved with BMW motorcycles. And there's an older motorcycle there, uh, R90S, with the fairing, he had uh, his hands on that design. There were three guys, Jan Felsman uh, and uh, George Hans Christen. Those are the three guys with uh, that uh, started the, the uh, Target design. So, at the time, Suzuki, again, their bikes were boring. They all look the same, but they had good technology. So uh, uh, Becker, who was the design uh, guy from Suzuki in Germany, contacted Target Design to say, hey, look, we've got some pretty good motorcycles here, but they're kind of boring. We need a new design. We need a futuristic thing. So based on the motorcycle that Hans Muth owned, which was an MV Agusta, so he had his bike and he played with his motorcycle and he was using cardboard and different things to come up with design. And Hans Muth's design was called Flywheel, where his concept was the bike has to look uniform from the beginning to the end. Headlight, tank, seat, front fender, back fender. Uh, aerodynamic streamline. Uh, so it was the first time also too that a Japanese company used a third party uh, design firm to come up with a motorcycle. So in 1979 they came up with a uh, the GS 550 and 650 Katana. So they presented it to uh, Suzuki but Suzuki saw the bike and they're like, man, we need something more, you know, futuristic, more crazy. Do something better for the 1100s. So, in the process, this is the timeline of what they did uh, with the uh, with the bike, as you can see over here, that this was the typical uniform Japanese motorcycle. Everybody looked the same. Everybody looked the same. All right. Um, 
Yeah, if you can move that over, appreciate that. Okay. All right. Then these guys can't see. So so anyway, so that was that was what the motorcycles were all looking like. Okay? So this was the MZ Augusta that won the prize, won the, the, the right to uh, win the design of the of the of the eighties. So Suzuki wound up, uh, the target design wound up making the 650 and the 550. But it was, when they presented it to Suzuki, Suzuki said, come on, we, we need something a little bit more better than that on 1100 version. So they designed, the whole process there came up to that motorcycle. So basically, the design was to come up with a motorcycle that had radical styling, was also speed stability. It was the first motorcycle that the Japanese made that had a fixed front fairing for stability. It had the first motorcycle that had clip-ons on the bike. And the philosophy also was the motorcycle, you should be in the motorcycle, not on the motorcycle. So this is the design, the final outcome of what it came out to be. And the first the first project was called ED1, which stands for European Design, because the Europeans were, me were making some really nice looking bikes, but the Japanese needed to catch up. So anyway, ED2 came out, and what happened, the prototype of the 1100 went to the Cologne Motorcycle Show in Germany in 1979, and it was an immediate hit. It was outstanding. And Suzuki said, no, that's it. We need to make this into a production motorcycle, not just a concept motorcycle. So in 82 is when the street version of the, 11, of the 1000 came out. And then in 83, the 1100 and the 750 came out. But this is my 83 uh, 1100. I like, I like the <laughs> So, this is the katana, and my wife refers to this as my first wife. <laughs> She's the second wife. But anyway, um, in, uh, in, in uh, 1979, uh, they came up with this design, but Suzuki wanted that fly design like the, the, uh, the MZ Busa without the little bikini fairing, but it wasn't really practical for speed, so they put a little uh, bikini fairing uh, on the front there. But uh, this motorcycle is, is an important motorcycle uh, back in the 80s. It still has history because a lot of motorcycles that you guys are riding today, especially a lot of these uh, crotch rockets, came from the design of this. If this bike didn't happen, some of this stuff might not be around right now. So the, the, the Suzuki, uh, they were pioneers uh, with having a third party come in and make this motorcycle. Now, they only made about 1,500 of these motorcycles into the United States. I still have one of them. Okay. Um, the a lot of, the, a lot of the, the, the motor that's in this motor uh, in the bike is a GS 1100 motor, which is a bulletproof motor. A lot of drag racing guys <laughs> were uh, were using the motorcycle, uh, boring them out. I mean, they were, they were they were indestructible. Also, Wes Cooley, you guys ever heard of Wes Cooley, the motorcycle racer? He raced katanas and he won several events. And also, uh, the katana has such a following that. It's almost like a cult following where you have different katana uh, groups in France, in Germany, in Japan. And to this day, the motorcycle still turns head. It still looks good. Um, and I remember one time when I first got the motorcycle, uh, I'm having a pizza I'm sitting by the window, and here comes this old lady just walking by, just basically taking some small little steps. And all of a sudden, she turns around and her eye catches this thing and she like stops. 
and it's like, you can see in her head saying, what planet did this thing come from, you know? But uh, my first motorcycle was a 1980, uh, 1982 uh, Honda Sabre. And it was a good basic bike. It was a good little, uh, you know, get around bike. It was nice and uh, uh, digital display, old modern, but uh, it was more of a stand up, you know, sit up style riding. But then when I was driving, uh, riding that motorcycle, I realized that I wanted something more aggressive. And unfortunately, being that they only had uh, a short amount of uh, inventory come to the United States, all these bikes were sold out immediately. The Suzuki dealership uh, owners bought one for themselves, and then they had, they had one to sell, and they were all gone. So when it came time for me to realize that I wanted to get this thing, it was gone. I couldn't find it. So what happened was I got lucky one day. I went to the uh, Honda dealership and had a big parts uh, accessory department, and... Uh, Met this other guy inside there, and uh, he was talking to me about he wanted to, you know, trade his motorcycle. And he had a VF uh, 45 uh, uh, Interceptor from Honda, and he asked me, "What did I want?" I said, "Well, the bike that I want to get is a Suzuki Katana. I can't get him." He goes, "I got a friend of mine that's selling his bike." I was like, "Katana?" He goes, "Yeah. Why is he selling it? He's selling it because the guy's wife." is making them sell it because they got the wedding. They want money for the wedding. So anyway, I got lucky to be at the right place at the right time. I wound up, uh, you know, buying this thing, you know. And then years, 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 years later, I used to have a motorcycle barbecue at my house every year. And I had all kinds of motorcycles on my driveway. I'm having a party. I got like, you know, 20 guys in my backyard. Small little area. My next door neighbor, he's having a party. And I see this guy and it's like, I know him from somewhere, I don't know where from where, yeah, same thing with, with him and me. So eventually, we got next to the fence, and he's like, hey man, no, I, I know you from somewhere. I said, yeah, I know you from, too, you know, some, from somewhere too, I just don't know what. He goes, did I sell you my motorcycle? I said, you're the mailman, right? He goes, yeah, yeah. So we started talking, he goes, you still got the bike? I go, yeah. Showed him the bike, we're in the garage, like 45 minutes in the garage, away from our parties. His wife is like, where is this guy? You know? So she hears us talking, and she goes out, and she's hanging out with us. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the husband asked me, he goes, hey, is there any way that you can sell me back the motorcycle? <laughs> I said, no, man, this is it, you know. But, uh, and then she turned to him and said, you know, I am so sorry. It was my fault that I made you sell that bike, you know. But, uh, but anyway, this motorcycle still, they, 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 there's uh, a whole following of this motorcycle. So there's a lot of these, uh, Companies that are doing resto mods with these things, they're Frankenstein in them, they're putting in all kinds of accessories and modern bike pieces onto this old 1983 thing, but they're making, they're upping the uh, technology and they're making the bike, you know, super modern, but yet still has, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that style. So the thing also too is that when Hans Muth, when Target Design was asked from by Suzuki to, uh, to, to make a bike, uh, design a bike for this. Hans Muth delved into Japanese culture. And he learned a lot about Japanese culture. And one of the things that intrigued him was the Japanese sword called the katana. Which is, that's what this is, is the katana, okay? This is supposed to be the finest sword um, that was ever made, type of thing. You know, the, the craftsmanship that went with this thing. It's a weapon, but also in the Japanese culture, this has uh, significant uh, honor value to this thing. These, these swords, these custom swords, are given to people for uh, weddings, uh, for temples, so there's a sacred thing behind the sword. But the thing is that when he designed, when he was designing the motorcycle, he wanted it to kind of have the sharpness of the katana. And as a matter of fact, when he presented the style of the motorcycle to uh, the president of Suzuki, which was, I forgot the guy's name was like uh, Osamu Suzuki, he told him, he goes, look, he goes, the katana, the sword is lethal. It's sharp. 
it could, it could, it could uh, damage you, it could injure you. Same thing with the motorcycle, if you don't respect it. So that immediately got the, uh, the, the Japanese uh, president all excited, says, you know. So that, so the katana is what this was designed after. And the thing with, uh, with the motorcycle also too, is that um, it has influenced so many of the Japanese uh, bikes. Uh, if, if this bike wasn't, uh, wasn't designed, there may not be, uh, you know, some of these motorcycles that are out here today, you know. But I've had this motorcycle since uh, 1984. I bought it in February of 1984. Um, I've got over 80,000 miles uh, on the motorcycle. I stopped riding it uh, back uh, when the kids were born and life gets in the way and stuff like that. So the bike was sitting for about uh, close to 20 years. But once moving down to Florida here, I wanted to get it back, uh, you know, back on the road. And over the years, um, I put a lot of goodies on it. To me, I wasn't really so concerned about the original, uh, you know, OEM style of the motorcycle. I always wanted to kind of personalize it because back in the day in New York, when I had this thing, I used to know basically only guys in New York that uh, had the katana. I was known as the yeah Johnny. That's the guy with the blue rims. Um, so. So what happened was, the reason why I've got all these different things on the motorcycle, now all these different accessories, is I was leaving my buddies, was going somewhere, and knucklehead doing a wheelie. And going down the street, this guy didn't see me, comes out, make a long story short, does a U-turn. I know he's gonna hit the guy. So I just aimed between the front tire and the windshield. And I was going to jump off when I hit. As I was hitting, as I was pushing off, is when I hit. And anyway, front wheel was inside the motor. The motor's all leaking oil, gasoline all over the place. But that's it. if I'm going to rebuild this thing, I'm going to put all kinds of aftermarket uh, goodies on the bike. So on the motorcycle, I want to putting on uh, performance machine rims, which they don't make those anymore. I've got 13-inch uh, full floaters. That's the best thing that I did with the motorcycle because I just stopped with one finger. Um, uh, the motor, the original motor that I had, uh, I had that bored out to 1170, incredible power, but you lose the reliability when you stop messing with the motor. And I just didn't want to deal with the uh, changing of the oil all the time and something else breaks. And I just, I just wanted to ride the motorcycle. So what I wound up doing is I wound up putting a stock 1150 motor in there because I just wanted to just hit the button and go and just enjoy the motorcycle. But I've got Olin's uh, racing sh uh, shock absorbers on the back. I've got Bassani uh, header. Uh, I've got uh, a uh, top end oiler kit uh, on the motorcycle. Um, there's just a lot, uh, the front end of this motorcycle comes from a uh, uh, Moto Guzzi 850, uh, Ducati 851. M1 off forks on the bike. Um, so I've got a lot of different parts on it. Uh, I still ride the bike to this day. As a matter of fact, uh, last year we went to uh, Birmingham, Alabama on the motorcycle. Won't do that again one day. Um, but uh, the bike still goes. The bike still goes. Um, my crazy speed days are over. But the bike still looks good today. Uh, it's still reliable. And uh, again, it's just you're welcome to, you know, read the timeline of the history of the motorcycle there. And um, if you have any questions, you can open it up to the floor. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Talking about the guy uh, selling the bike for the, for the wedding. So, the bike is sitting in the garage. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, it's off. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, <laughs> whatever. I, I just, I'll just talk uh, with, uh, just uh, loud. All right. So, the bike is sitting in the garage. One day, one day. I got my American flag on the bike. One day I'll fix it. One year goes by. Five years goes by. Time goes on. You know, bills, mortgage. You know, my wife's on my case. Come on, sell the bike. We need the money and this and that. And I'm like, no, no, no. 
And one, she got me one time where I, I just got sick and tired of listening to her. And I said, okay, you know, whatever. I'll sell it. Yeah. <laughs> so I put a little black morning band on the... Uh, Hello, hello, hello. All right, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello, 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 hello. Okay. All right, so uh, I put a little black morning band on the uh, the brake lever, and uh, I thought I'd get any calls to, 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 uh, to uh, uh, sell the bike. One guy from Puerto Rico, he wanted to come down, take the motorcycle, he was a baton collector in Puerto Rico, and I'm like, nah. You gotta be here, cash deal. I don't wanna be holding this thing. First come, first serve type of deal. This other guy calls me up who's a chef uh, in New York. So he comes over here, I'm interested in the motorcycle. You still selling it? Yeah. Come over, comes to the house. I finish cleaning the motorcycle up. I make it look all nice and stuff. Clean all the spider webs off. Bike still runs, no problem. We start, we're talking for like an hour. Just having a good conversation about motorcycles. Then it was time to start getting into the deal, you know. And then he starts looking at the motorcycle and he's checking the engine. He's like, on the spoiler, man, the bike is leaking. I said, that's not oil, it's WD-40. I, 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 you know, after I clean the motorcycle, I spray the engine down with WD-40. You know, you can eat off this motor. The guy, so, so the guy's getting kind of like silly now. We're trying to chew me down with the price. And my son is on the window on the top watch and listen to the whole thing. So my son comes down and he goes, Papi, you're not really going to sell the motorcycle, are well, you right? And then my wife is at the front steps and she's like, you don't have to sell the bike if you don't want, you know. So I turn to the guy and go, hey man, did you hear what my son said? The bike, the, the deal's off. Come on, man, I came over from New York, I got cash in my pocket. I said, you know what, man? We had a nice conversation at the beginning, then you got stupid on me at the end. And then, you know what? The bike's not for sale now. The guy was pissed off, but thanks me for my son. I still got this thing, otherwise I would have been kicked. I would have been like that guy that, was, that got married. He's like, oh man, I wish I would have still kept it, you know, type of deal. But I hate, you know, you hear those stories, you know, and uh, just life gets in the way and that thing happens, you know. But, uh, what was the price? well, the, the, this was the most expensive motorcycle at the time. And 1100 back in the day, 4,000 was a lot, but that was a going price, 4,000 for 1,100. This bike was like 47 plus cash, about 5,000, you know? It was the most expensive motorcycle at the time. And uh, I wound up buying the bike for uh, 3,500, you know? And I only had 3,000 3, miles on it, brand new, broken in stock, you know? Uh, but uh, it was funny because I made a deal with the guy and, uh, you know, ride my other motorcycle. And after we do the deal, transfer the money and stuff, the guy goes, hey, can I ask you a question, man? I go, yeah. He goes, what do you do for a living, man? I'm a police officer. You're a police officer? I thought you were a freaking drug dealer, man. <laughs> I said, why? He goes, you're a young guy. You got your motorcycle. You're paying cash for this bike. I said, dude, I'm living at home. I don't have any bills. I'm, I'm good right now, <laughs> you know. But, uh, yeah, I've been I've been to Canada with this thing. I've been to all over Pennsylvania, New Jersey, down Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, all of up, upstate New York, Connecticut. I, I I ride this thing. And back in the day, I rode with buddies, the guys that had the you know the super bikes of the 80s, early 80s, 82, 83, 84, and these guys all had these like souped up beautiful motorcycles, and they just drive to the park and just hang out and just look good. I said, guys, let's, 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 we got this big box, man. Let's go for rides, man. So I, I turned these guys on to cruise it into the mountains and stuff like that. You know, but uh, a, a lot of the guys back in the day, they were just into just, you know, looking good and, you know, working out and hanging out with the motorcycle. <laughs> let's ride this thing, man. You know, but uh, yeah, it's, it still goes to the end. And of course, the motorcycles of today, the technology is just out of control. There's all 500s, 600s. It's just blows this thing away, but my speed days are over. My, right now, I just hit the button, go, look good, enjoy it, you know. But this is the motorcycle that's still, that's part of history in motorcycling. 
uh, that was able to have an influence in the, the, uh, the Japanese motorcycle. Because the thing about it is that Suzuki wanted to have a motorcycle that had a European design to it. So the ED1 was the 650 and this is the ED2. Now the thing is this, is that in 83, that's it, done. They came out with the 1100 and the 750. But in Japan, they had 250 katanas, they had 400 katanas. You know, and then in 1991, they wound up making uh, 200 katanas. It got sold out immediately. And then in 2001, they made 1,100 Suzuki katanas, and they were all sold out also, but they were only sold in Japan. So it's still a collector's motorcycle. It's very rare to see these motorcycles around. You know, unfortunately, they got crashed, they got destroyed, they got painted off and stuff. That's the stock color for the 1100. And it still, it still goes good today. Uh, oh, you want to hear it? Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Those wheelies are over. Yeah. That got me in trouble. <laughs> Now this is the uh, the street baffle. Uh, I used to run with the competition baffle, which was like a hole that big. But I'm older now. I'm riding with guys. I don't want to hear me making noise. So <laughs> I got something that's a little bit more reasonable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's it, man. That's, uh, 
this is it. Any other questions? So I hope that you guys get together with Edson and you know get a get your bike in here. I'll be curious to hear about your motorcycles and so would everybody else. But guys, thank you so much for all your attention. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah.